Hi, welcome to this uh, online course on productivity and efficiency analysis. My name is uh, Timo Kuosmonen. I'm a professor of uh, business math and statistics at Aalto University School of Business. I have about 25 years of experience in uh, productivity and efficiency analysis. And in this course, I will share some uh, insights and experiences in this field. So in the first introductory lectures, I will start by describing the conceptual setting, what is productivity and some of the related concepts like efficiency and also motivate why it is important. So let us start from the macroeconomic perspective. Uh, since the times of Adam Smith, my economists have been interested in uh, what explains the wealth of nations. And in this uh, quotation by uh, Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, uh, Krugman notes that uh, productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it is almost everything. And he continues to refer to the improvement of standards of living over time and uh, the fact that productivity plays a very critically important role in, the, in this. So to understand this claim better, let me refer to another Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, Robert Solow, uh, whose work in, uh, in the 1950s showed that uh, economic growth essentially depends on two things. Uh, firstly, the growth in the factors of uh, production, essentially labor and capital, and secondly, on uh, productivity growth. So in his, his work, um, Solow treats this uh, productivity as a uh, unexplained part of the economic growth. So, so the part of economic growth that uh, we cannot explain by, by labor and capital. Some authors refer to this uh, measure of productivity, therefore, as a solo residual or a measure of our ignorance in the sense that uh, this is something that we cannot really explain. So in that sense, uh, uh, Productivity growth is very, very important part to explain that why, why uh, we have economic growth in the first place, but also differences across countries. Why, why uh, uh, rich countries are rich and poor countries are poor. Typically, developing countries do not have shortage of labor, but uh, they, they may have shortage of capital. But perhaps even more importantly is then how do these labor and capital resources are utilized? How countries can, can achieve uh, uh, high level of uh, uh, economic well-being with the existing resources. And in that sense, this efficiency of utilizing resources is the, is the key idea in productivity, not only at the macroeconomic level, but also at the micro level of uh, firms and, uh, and uh, smaller units of, of production. So to get a little bit to more, more detailed level, let us uh, characterize the production process, how, how uh, economists usually think about it. So in this uh, flow diagram, on the top I have indicated the inputs. And uh, I mentioned there already on the previous slide the two essential factors of production, labor and capital. But in addition to this, uh, these uh, two factors, of course, there are all sorts of intermediate inputs. Uh, different types of materials and energy, to mention a few, also, also purchased services, for example. So these type of inputs, they enter to the production process, which I have indicated here in this diagram in the middle. And from the other side of the production process, then we get uh, uh, different types of outputs. Uh, economists are typically interested in the, in the goods and services produced, and uh, those can be value of those can be measured by by total sales or value added. Um, but then, in addition, in in more recent decades, uh, there has been much more attention also to the undesirable outputs such as pollution and uh, nowadays greenhouse gas emissions such as carbon dioxide. So these sort of issues are also very closely related to the productivity. So I want to highlight here that we economists, we typically model production only by, by looking at what goes into the process, the inputs, and what goes out of the process, the output. 
but we leave the more detailed modeling of uh, of uh, what happens inside the process uh, more to the to the engineers we do make some kind of uh, um, models and axioms and assumptions about the process but uh, uh, we we uh, abstract from the from the technical details of the of the of the sort of uh, designs of the of the production process we mainly focus on modeling it through inputs and outputs So how do these inputs and outputs then relate to productivity? So in general, we understand productivity as the ratio of output to input. The ratio of output to input. And here I want to distinguish between uh, so-called partial productivity measures and total productivity measures. Uh, perhaps the most, uh, most important partial productivity measure is the labor productivity which can be defined as a ratio of uh, uh, total output and the labor input. As I mentioned, uh, the total output could be measured, for example, uh, as aggregate as, as the total sales, or sometimes as the value added. And labor input could be measured as, as hours of, uh, of uh, work or number of workers, for example, just to illustrate the concept. Of course, the, the partial productivity measures such as labor productivity then would ignore other factors of production and other inputs. So including, of course, capital and, and intermediate inputs. So a little bit more challenging task to measure productivity is to use total productivity measure, which is understood as the as a ratio of total output to total input. But here comes then, of course, the basic challenge and fundamental challenge in the productivity measure. How do we measure the total output? How do we aggregate the different types of outputs to an output measure? And how do we aggregate different types of inputs to have an aggregate of the inputs? To answer this, uh, this issue, uh, there are different types of approaches, different types of uh, measures, indicators, indices, and so on and so on. But ultimately, all of them are trying to address this fundamental challenge to aggregate outputs and aggregate inputs to have a, have a productivity measure. And not only that, of course, uh, this, uh, this, uh, even if you are satisfied with the uh, economic uh, monetary aggregates of the outputs, uh, as I mentioned before, nowadays it's also increasingly important to uh, try to take into account uh, environmental bads such as greenhouse gas emission. And while these, uh, these um, outputs and inputs that are um, purchased and sold in the, in the markets, they could be valued based on, on price information or cost shares or revenue shares. Uh, for such kind of non-market outputs, such as greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, there comes the challenge, what kind of prices we should, how should we aggregate those uh, environmental bads to the total productivity index. So this gives the challenge of how do we measure environmental adjusted productivity or green productivity, if you like. So this, I believe, is an ongoing challenge. And I will also refer to that later in this course. So, so far in this, this uh, macroeconomic uh, references to uh, to solo residual and Paul Grugman's quotation, we talked about the uh, change of productivity over time. And this is typically how macroeconomists uh, think about productivity. So, so typically they, they have in mind the productivity growth. Uh, but as I mentioned, of course, the level of productivity can be also of interest. And especially in micro level, uh, this kind of productivity dispersion across different firms has been a, a great issue. What explains, for example, differences in, in output per worker across different firms, even within a very narrowly defined industry? So productivity can, be, can refer to either level of productivity or change of productivity over time. So what makes uh, the area of productivity and efficiency analysis um, very interesting, but also a little bit challenging that it is truly a multidisciplinary field. So on this slide, I have uh, I have indicated at least three uh, very important uh, disciplines uh, that are interested in productivity. So far, all my my 
examples and references refer to economics and uh, the Solos works forms the basis for the so-called growth accounting approach. Uh, there are also other branches of economies, economics more, more in the micro level, for example, uh, industrial organization literature, where productivity is also of, of great interest. But uh, productivity is not only, only uh, property of economists. Uh, uh, in statistics and, uh, and uh, the branch of econometrics, which falls somewhere between economics and statistics, uh, there is also great interest to the, to the estimation of uh, productivity indices. And in this course, we will discuss this uh, stochastic frontier analysis, SFA approach, as one example of that, that, that uh, domain. And if we go beyond economics and statistics, uh, there's also the field of uh, operations research and management science, uh, where productivity and perhaps maybe more efficiency analysis is a, is a very important uh, uh, domain. Their data envelopment analysis is the, is the brand name for this type of uh, analysis that we are talking about in this course. So uh, very often uh, there are researchers in different fields are interested in similar kind of topics, perhaps using slightly different methods and different terminology, but uh, these areas in productivity analysis are very closely, closely linked. Um, that also perhaps uh, explains that uh, the topic of productivity is often understood as some kind of marginal niche area, even though it actually overlaps very large uh, segments in different uh, disciplines. To illustrate you this point, uh, I have here collected some uh, examples of, uh, of uh, highly cited articles in this, uh, this domain. Um, at least as far as I could identify, uh, five uh, uh, very highly cited articles are uh, the EJOR article by Charles Cooper and Rhodes from 1978. There is Michael Farrell's article in the Journal of Royal Statistical Society. There's Banker Chance and Cooper Management Science article from 1984. Uh, the Solos work from 1957, uh, which I already referred to before. And then there is uh, Eigner Lovell Schmidt from uh, Journal of Econometrics 1977. And these numbers of citations. Uh, are really staggeringly high. You, you, can, you can see that there are tens of thousands of, uh, of citations to these works. This just shows the influence of these works have had in, in many different areas, not just economics, not just operations research, but many, many different applied areas. And if you think about these methodological approaches, you might see that uh, these first three, uh, Charles Cooper and Rhodes, Farrell and Bank and Charles and Cooper, they all relate to this uh, data envelopment analysis method. Solo's paper is the foundation of the growth accounting and Eigner, Lovell and Schmidt is the uh, foundational article of the uh, stochastic frontier analysis, which I mentioned in the previous slides. All of them have been, have been uh, highly influential. Uh, of course, we shouldn't directly compare these citation statistics because the uh, citation practices differ to some extent uh, in different fields and different different domains. But anyway, I hope that this, uh, these uh, tens of thousands of citations uh, illustrate you that uh, we are not talking about some very marginal niche area that is only some handful of people are interested in the, in the, in the world. Uh, there are a lot of lot of application of the type of methods that we are going to consider in this course. So one source of that uh, that um, makes also difficult uh, and perhaps also confusing is the fact that in everyday language we refer to productivity and efficiency very often as almost as uh, interchangeably. Then there are also related concepts like uh, effectiveness or performance, economic performance or productive performance. And these different terms, they have slightly different connotations, but, but uh, very often people use them almost interchangeably, which is a potentially a source of confusion. So how I like to think about them in, in a bit more structured manner is to, is to use this kind of conceptual distinction. So uh, if you think about the overall productivity growth, and remember, 
productivity I defined as the as a ratio between output and input. However, that ratio is is uh, then in more practically operationalized, but it's it's basically ratio of output to input. So the, this ratio, the level of it, and also the growth over time, it depends on uh, three types of uh, of uh, factors. One is the technical progress. So if uh, if uh, the production possibilities expand over time. That's one source of productivity growth, which is often what uh, what uh, mainstream economists uh, are interested in. And very often, actually, uh, economists talk about productivity growth almost as a synonym to the technical progress. If we think more about this um, operational research uh, management science domain, there, the key interest is actually in this efficiency improvement. So, uh, efficiency can be can be also also divided in three types of efficiency. We can talk about technical efficiency. We can talk about scale efficiency, and we can talk about allocative efficiency. I will come to this distinction in more detail later in this course. And then if we think about this uh, industrial organization literature in economics, they are mainly interested in the structural change, especially entry and exit of firms and uh, resource reallocation between the firms. Very often this structural change uh, is discussed as the, as the impact of entry and exit of firms to the industry productivity. But actually this kind of structural changes can be also occurring uh, within the firm, so there might be entry and exit of uh, of uh, plants or other other units within the firm, and there can be also reallocation of resources between the plants or units within the firm. So I would argue that this impact of structural change has been kind of under uh, underutilized area, for example, in the in the uh, operational research and management science literature. So there is still. A, a great uh, progress could be achieved with the, with the more tighter integration of the of the different domains that are interested in productivity and efficiency analysis. Notice also when we talk about uh, in more detail about efficiency analysis and efficiency, uh, we can think about it as a, as a one of the three components that uh, that influence productivity. But it's of course by no means the only. Also, the technical progress matters and. Uh, structural changes matter. So we should not forget about it. In that sense, I think about efficiency analysis uh, uh, as a sort of sub-problem within the productivity, productivity measurement and analysis. So efficiency improvement is one potential way to, to improve productivity, but not the only one. So if you then zoom more to this uh, question of efficiency and efficiency analysis, which is often uh, taking place at more micro level of, uh, of uh, uh, firms and other organizations or, or units within the organization, then there are several types of uh, interesting research questions that the efficiency analysis is trying to answer. We may start from the very basic one that, uh, that uh, which units within the firm or which firms are the best performers in the group of, uh, of units or firms? Which ones are the worst ones? So we are trying to identify the, either the best ones or the, or the weakest ones. And this can be very valuable information for benchmarking. So perhaps those uh, average units or, or particularly weaker units can learn something from those best performers. Then, then by identifying those best performance, we can also maybe somehow try to transfer the good practices of those best performers and use them as the role models or examples. And this kind of use of the role models is generally referred to as benchmarking. A little bit more challenging question is then uh, to come up with some kind of ordinal ranking of this units based on performance. This is very common. Uh, Topic, for example, when uh, we, we consider universities or other educational in, in ed educational uh, units. So, for example, what is the performance ranking of the of the universities in a given country or or secondary schools? 
So very often this performance ranking is of, of great interest and also uh, public debate if we talk about schools or, or universities. That in that case, we would be talking about ordinal ranking. Even more challenging task would be then to try to measure in, in uh, absolute terms how big gap is there in the, in the performance between the best performer and the average unit or some given unit under evaluation? How much could be achieved by improving the performance to the same level with the best performers? So this would be already then not just giving an ordinal ranking, but, uh, but uh, measuring uh, uh, in absolute units, for example, in monetary terms or percentage terms, the performance gap. In some kind of applications, it's necessary to do this kind of measurement in absolute units. And finally, having uh, identified some kind of uh, uh, quantitative measures for the performance gap, maybe the most important from like a managerial and policy perspective might be which factors actually can explain these efficiency differences across units such as firms or other units. What kind of management practices or, or policies could help to improve performance? Uh, are some of these uh, uh, efficiency differences that we can explain, are there something that can be actually influenced by policy or management? There might be also some external factors that cannot be influenced. So in that case, we cannot really blame the weaker performers uh, for, the, for, the, for the lower performance if it's not really their fault. But uh, in my mind, uh, just measuring the uh, efficiency is a good step. It, what, what gets measured gets done. But I believe further attention should go to this last question, that how could we actually improve performance? Are there some kind of measures that, that uh, policy measures or man managerial uh, practices that could help to improve performance? So these illustrate the, the type of questions and types of challenges that uh, we face in, in efficiency analysis, but also like, like how do we phrase the efficiency analysis. Uh, so very often in efficiency analysis, uh, uh, traditionally, the main interest is in the efficiency scores, just measuring efficiency. But I try to indicate with these research questions, sometimes it is enough to just identify which units are the best performers or perhaps the weakest performers. And sometimes it's actually more interesting to see what kind of factors uh, uh, influence or explain those differences in performance. So we come back to these types of questions uh, later in this course. Just as an illustration of uh, types of areas with, where this kind of approach is uh, have been found useful and, and where this kind of, uh, kind of research questions appear. Here are some uh, limited list of examples of application areas that I'm, I'm familiar with and many of those I have also, also uh, worked with myself. Uh, agricultural economics is of course very one traditional area where, where issues of production and productivity of farms and other production systems has been of central interest for, for a long time. Another area is, is uh, banks and other financial institutions, uh, where, for example, uh, there are lots of studies that look at, uh, look at bank, bank branch efficiencies and try to explain also the, the differences and also, also do this kind of benchmarking to, to, to facilitate good practices. Schools and universities and other educational institutions I actually briefly mentioned already. Uh, one very important industry is, uh, is energy, where there's a lots of studies with, uh, regarding power plants, but also the transmission and distribution systems. In fact, uh, I will use as an empirical example in this course the uh, Finnish electricity distribution units as an example. So we dig into much more into detail to this particular example in this course. Um, environmental applications, pollution in environmental ecological economics, that's one very important and growing area for, for the types of uh, analysis that we will consider in this course. 
healthcare and other public services, very important areas, particularly because uh, very often in these types of applications, uh, we do not have uh, we do not have necessarily market prices for the inputs and uh, and outputs. Consider, for example, the public publicly provided healthcare services, which are uh, produced by by uh, by government uh, funding, but uh, but are not sold for the for the true market price. So there, for example, then the sh challenge becomes: How do we value this uh, multiple, multiple and very large number of different outputs that that healthcare services provide? Um, in the case of ut other utilities like uh, like uh, gas, water, sewage, district heating, these are very similar to the electricity distribution example that we will consider in more detail in this course. Uh, there, the issue is actually very often that uh, that these um, these these types of uh, utilities are local monopolies which do not face uh, competition. So, using the efficiency analysis can help to then uh, provide incentives for those uh, those utilities to operate in more efficient uh, fashion and and to counter the the monopoly power of such uh, such uh, utilities. Transportation is also another example of a network industry with airlines, railroads, where there have been actually a lot of uh, 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 market uh, liberalization and deregulation in the in the in the recent decades. So this limited number of uh, application areas just is to, it was intended to to serve as an illustration of the of the uh, great potential applications that uh, that these types of methods and the impact where where these kind of methods have had uh, over the over the years uh, also to to illustrate the potential applications i want to mention that i started from this uh, macroeconomic level of of wealth of nations uh, but uh, there are enormous number of different levels of aggregation where this kind of uh, productivity and efficiency analysis can be conducted. Uh, the most micro level that I'm aware of it considers individual persons, so, so uh, performance comparisons of individual workers. Aggregating from individual person level to the teams or plants or establishments, we can think about some subunits of within a given firm. And then these, these units, plants, teams, establishments, they can be aggregated to to the firm level. Firms can be further aggregated to the industry level and industries can be aggregated to the regional and, and country level. So you can see this kind of uh, uh, multiple different levels of, of uh, very micro level to the, to the macroeconomic level of, of, uh, of countries and regions. So this first uh, video lecture has now come to the conclusion. I will proceed in the next lecture to talk about the taxonomy of frontier estimation methods and go to in more detail to particularly this uh, data and development analysis from the operations research and management science and stochastic frontier analysis from the, from the econometrics and statistics. And uh, we come back to this kind of uh, more, more uh, grand issues of uh, of uh, productivity and deco decomposing this uh, productivity to various sources uh, of productivity growth uh, uh, towards the uh, end of the this course. So thank you for your attention and uh, see you on the next video. Bye.